notebooks and pens, papers, iPads, smart devices, whatever you're using, get those out. Uh, we journeyed into the book of Exodus uh, last week as we still are looking at uh, uh, the revelation of grace from Genesis to Revelation, and we're finding grace. Um, I want to start off with a little bit uh, of just background information tonight before we get into uh, Exodus, the 12th chapter. The word Exodus um, is not a Hebrew word. Um, it was first taken from the Hebrew. The names, um, the name, the word Hebrew. Uh, for Exodus is in the Hebrew comes from the first two words in the book of Exodus in the first chapter uh, and these are the names of the sons of Israel uh, and it, the Hebrew word really means names uh, is wor what the Hebrew word means but the Septuagint which is written in Latin which it was the first ever uh, translation from the original language of Hebrew uh, to Latin, the Septuagint. Uh, so we have the word Exodus that comes from that, and it, then it was translated into Greek. And the word Exodus uh, means the road or the way out. In Latin, it would be E X O D O S, Exodos, road or way out. In the Greek, it means going out. The word exodus means going out. And we get that, like we talked last week about the coming out of the children of Israel out of Egypt. Egypt is always a type and shadow of sin. I've had a few more questions and people even ask out loud last week, what's a type or shadow? Um, a type and shadow is, the, is not the substance. It's not the real thing. If the sun is shining here, well, you can even see, this light is shining, I'm the substance, that's the shadow. The example that I've given you before is if the light is shining on Lisa and there's a shadow and I'm looking at that shadow and I'm saying, mm-hmm, look at that. And I'm following this shadow around because it looks real good. But then I see her face to face and I have the substance, the real thing, that shadow won't do anymore. And so the Old Testament is a foreshadowing that gives us types and symbols of the real thing. And in the New Testament, Christ is the substance. And once you've tasted of the Lord, <laughs> the shadow won't do any longer. And so we don't want to go back to, oh, we learn from the Old Testament and the Old Covenant. Uh, we look at the Christology or the study of Christ. In every book of the Old Testament, you can find Christ. It's foretelling and foreshadowing, prophesying of uh, the Messiah to come. Uh, so Egypt is a type and shadow of sin, so that coming out or that road out um, is the exodus that we, we hear. Um, there are three main sections in the book of Exodus. You can take the book of Exodus and clump it in three main sections. The first would be the, the liberation or the deliverance of the children of Israel from Egypt. Be a type and shadow of us being delivered from our sins. Bondage, slavery. And that's the first chapter through the 15th chapter. Then we see the journey uh, to Mount Sinai after they've crossed through the Red Sea uh, and the establishment of the covenant. That's the second section, the journey to Mount Sinai and the establishment of the covenant through the law. That's chapters 15, verse 22 through chapter 24. That would be the middle section. And then we wrap it up with the final section of Exodus. We see the building of the tabernacle, which would become God's dwelling place, the tent where God dwelt. And that's chapters 25 through chapters 40, where uh, it ends. So you have the deliverance of the children of Israel. We're going to look at a little bit of that tonight. We see the journey that they take uh, up to Mount Sinai after crossing through the Red Sea and the giving of the law, the establishing of the Old Covenant system. Uh, and then we have the building of the tabernacle, 
the tent of God, God gives Moses specific instructions and directions about what it should look like, what the what furniture should be in it, how to dismantle it, how to carry it as they went through the wilderness, just all about the tabernacle. We, we also see in these three main sections, we see the bondage of the children of Israel. We talked about it a little bit last week. The call of Moses in Exodus, the third chapter, where we see the Lord uh, as a flame in the bush and the voice of God talking to Moses. We're going to see the plagues briefly tonight. I'm not going to go over all the plagues with you. We could spend uh, several weeks on each plague and be here for another thousand years. Uh, then we see the Passover, which I want to spend time on tonight, the giving of the law and the building of the tabernacle through all of these three sections. Now, throughout these three sections, we see Israel. Now, Israel is a... Uh, if Egypt is a type and shadow of sin, then what is Israel a type and shadow of? Us. Uh, the, the church. We're a type and shadow... Uh, Israel is a type and shadow of uh, the church. Us. Uh, and then Moses would be a type and shadow of what? Jesus, the deliverer. God sends Moses to those in bondage, and he uses Moses to help deliver his children out of that bondage, and because of that, uh, that's a type and shadow. What's going on? TV die on you? Sorry. It's all right. They've got their Bibles. So throughout, throughout these three sections uh, that we just mentioned, we see the church, or Israel, uh, in several different ways. We see their lack of faith, because they didn't mix their faith with what God told Moses to do when he first came and said, I'm going to be a deliverer, I'm going to get you out of here. They didn't believe it. They, didn't, they had a lack of faith. Then we see their continual complaining. A lack of faith, a continual complaining from the time Moses shows up all the way through the wilderness. Always complaining. Uh, then we see them in their unrest through the journey. They're not at rest. And we finally see them worshiping a golden calf. So you see God's people, the chosen people of God, and they're going to have a lack of faith. They're going to complain all the time. Uh, they're going to be at unrest. They're not at rest at all uh, in what God already told them He was going to do for them. And then they end up worshiping uh, another God. Despite all of this, <laughs> despite people within the body of Christ having a lack of faith, despite because even when we're faithless, He's faithful, uh, despite the church being at unrest in their journey and not having a faith in the finished work of Christ and realizing that He's finished the work and our posture should be one of rest, but in the journey we become unrestful. We're just like the children of Israel. Uh, unfortunately, there's a lot of complaining in the body of Christ. We complain about the temperature. We complain about the music. We complain about the one sitting beside us. We complain about... <laughs> despite all of this we continually see God extending his grace it's, a, it's amazing that in the book where the law is handed down the main theme the underlying theme of the whole book is God's grace in Exodus Grace. It's undeserved. It's unmerited. They're not worthy of it. And what ends up happening is God comes down to... He had already prophesied in Genesis 15th chapter that they were going to be down there for 400 years. So now this is the culmination of all that. This is the climax of the 400 years of bondage and slavery that Moses shows up on the scene as a deliverer for the children of Israel, God's people. And they're going to complain about it. God's delivering them. They didn't deserve it. They didn't earn it. Their slavery down there for 400 years didn't earn them the right for God to come and deliver them out of that bondage. He's a good father and he wanted to deliver his children out of that. He had their best interest at heart. That's his grace. Same way with our salvation. It's undeserved. It's unwarranted. We didn't. If you earned it, it would be called a wage. Not grace. Uh, if you work to earn something, if you work 
a 40 hour work week and they told you they were going to pay you X amount of dollars for that 40 hour work week at the end of the week, you earned your wage. It's not grace. And these people didn't deserve it. Um, did we get it working? What happened? Did it Sunday too? Powerful. You can turn and look at the screen behind you if you'd like. <laughs> um, get your Bibles out or your iPads, your smartphones. Look at Exodus, the 20th chapter. This is the key verse in all of Exodus. Exodus, the 20th chapter, verse number 2. Say amen when you get there. Amen. It's good for sometimes just to flip through and not have all the technology working. It just, boom, we get spoiled to all that. And it says, I am the Lord your God. He already told Moses in chapter 3, I am is the one that sent you. And now he's saying to the people, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. We see who he is. And we see what he did for his children. I am the Lord your God. He made it very personal to them. He said, I am the Lord your God. Egypt had over 400 and some gods they were worshiping. The number one god they had was the god of Ra, R-A, the sun god. That was the, the number one. But they had tons of other, four, over 400 gods that they were worshiping. Idols, false gods. But God Almighty shows up, says, I am that I am. That's who Moses told the people that sent him. And then he responds in verse 2 of chapter 20 to the people and says, I am the Lord your God. And I have delivered you out of the land of Egypt, out of the land or the house uh, of bondage. Now, the first five books of the Bible, Moses is the author. Uh, it's called the Pentateuch. It's penta meaning five. Uh, it's the first five books of the Bible. But they are not the oldest books of the Bible, just because they're listed chronologically first. Job is the oldest book in the Bible. Um, was written before these five books. Um, we can look at Exodus and we say it's a book of the law because the law is handed down and we have a little bit of explanation about uh, the, those laws, the Ten Commandments that are written on stone tablets. We'll see here, maybe not tonight, but we'll, we'll get to it. Um, but most of all, Exodus is a book of history. Now, Hebrew history... Uh, Throughout the scripture, we don't just have a lot of, like our history books will give you chronological dates, and they throw a lot of dates at you, uh, and I remember in history, we just had a lot of dates, you know, this war happened in 1812, this war happened in 1976, this war, or 1776, this war happened, so you've got all these dates of different things, Kennedy was assassinated this year, dates, Hebrews, uh, the Jews' history is not written that way. It's usually given to you in a series of events. Now, now that we can go back and look in history, we know what those dates were. We can know that this probably is around 1486 B.C., according to most scholars. Okay, um, So you, we don't have biblical reference to those dates, but we know that Pharaoh, who was... Moses' stepbrother historically lived, and the Egyptians have dates that are given to that, so we can track it back. But the Hebrews just gives a series of events. So Exodus is just a history book of a series of events that happened to the children of Israel. It's giving us the history, and history is factual. It's, it's factual information. It's not a hearsay. This is factual information. These are stories uh, that are true. These aren't just things that somebody came up with and put in a book for Sunday school to make God look real good. The, these are historical events that took place. The central me message of Exodus is God's grace towards His people. He redeemed them from Egypt, sin, he miraculously saves them from Pharaoh's army. He leads them through the Red Sea, he, and he establishes a covenant with them. This is the, the redemption of the people of Israel. That's God's grace. The, the miraculous saving of them uh, because they're stuck between a rock and a hard place with Pharaoh's army breathing down their neck about to kill them and the uncrossable Red Sea in front of them. 
That's a miraculous salvation, even though He had already redeemed them, brought them out of Egypt, sin, and now they're in the wilderness somewhere, starting out their journey, and they face an insurmountable problem already right off the bat, and they've got the enemy breathing down their neck. See how all these types and shadows? New, new believers, they come to Christ. They have a battle right off the bat, and the enemy's breathing down their neck, but God saves you even in that. That's His grace. And then when He opens up the Red Sea, and they cross through on dry land, that's a type and shadow of baptism. They went through to the other side, and on the other side of the Red Sea, they began a new life. And when we go into the water... We're symbolizing that the old man has died. I was crucified with Christ. Not that it's, not, it's not I who lives, but Christ who lives in me. So his resurrection was our resurrection. And even Corinthians, Paul talks about the death, the burial, and the resurrection in baptism. And I, when I do baptism, I baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And I end my prayer in Jesus' name. And I usually, when I'm dunking people, say, buried with Christ and raised to new life. And on the other side of the Red Sea, the children of Israel began a new life. So crossing the Red Sea is a type and shadow of baptism. And then the establishment of the covenant with them. God, That's all God's grace. Every bit of that uh, is God's grace. What can we learn from God in Exodus? Well, we know that He revealed His name to Moses, the great I Am. He, God, fulfills His purpose through he, these historical acts. And the Exodus, this is what we can learn from God, the Exodus was a critical event in the plan of redemption. God setting the stage in Exodus, second book of the Bible, for His redemption plan that's going to come when Jesus is sent in the flesh. God in the flesh. <laughs> It didn't just get so bad one day that God and Jesus decided to send Jesus. Well, it, yeah, because I think some people think, well, it just got really, really, really bad in the Old Testament, and it got so bad for the children of Israel that God had to send Jesus to rescue them out of that. No, He is the Lamb of God, slain, before the foundation of the world. So God's always only had one plan. His plans always, He didn't have a plan A, and because Adam screwed it up in the garden, He went with plan B. No, He was slain before the foundation of the world. So He knew from the beginning of time that this was going to be what He would come and do. But Exodus lays out that purpose and that plan. We will see the plan of salvation and the plan of redemption in the book of Exodus. The Christology of Exodus, the study of Christ in Exodus, we see Jesus as the Passover lamb. If you will go through the book of, of books of the Bible, even in the Old Testament, you will see Jesus as certain things in each book of the Bible. When you were in the Passion Play at Maranatha, you and Ter Pastor Terry Hogue did the books of the Bible. Did you do the New Testament? He did the Old Testament. And they would proclaim at the beginning of that from every book of the Bible who Jesus was. Uh, for, I can just rem remember a few of them in the book of Ruth. He's our kinsman redeemer. You know, you can go through every book of the Bible. So in Exodus, I believe they said he is the Passover lamb because that's the Christology or the study of Christ in the book of Exodus. And, and we see him there. Many scholars point out that uh, the Exodus was the most important salvation event of the Old Testament. It was, it was a very important event because without it, we don't have this foreshadowing uh, of the salvation plan of God. It is the Exodus that provides the prim uh, primary model of God's idea of redemption, not just in the Old Testament, but in the New Testament it is well as one of the keys to understanding the meaning of the cross. It becomes one of the keys to understanding the cross of Christ and the meaning of the cross. So if you only hear a New Testament gospel preached 
and you don't have the background information of the Old Testament and the Passover, many, many, many folks never understand the cross of Christ and the finished work. So we don't preach an Old Testament, Old Covenant mentality to keep you in bondage to laws and rules and regulations. We preach it to show you the plan and the pattern of God has not changed. If we see grace in Exodus, it's not a new doctrine that's being pre preached. It's not something that has just come on the scene and become uh, popular over the last several years. It's been the plan and uh, idea of God from the beginning. And that's been the underlying theme. And so Exodus really, really points that out to us. Turn with me to the book of Exodus, the 12th chapter. And just stay there for just a moment. So um, we, we talked about Moses in chapter 3 and 4, or chapter 3 last week, and, and uh, God sends him down as a deliverer. Uh, in chapter 4, Moses' rod turns into a serpent. His, land, his hand becomes leprosy. God's showing him how he's going to use him. I mean, he sticks his hand in his robe, and it's clean. He pulls it out, and it's lepros he's got leprosy all over it. And then he puts his hand back in his body. It's gone. Uh, God is beginning to show Moses he's all-powerful. He's beginning to show him, I can do anything I want to do anytime I want to do it. He's trying to say, if I can turn your rod, what's that in your hand? It's a rod. Throw it down, Moses. He threw it down and became a snake. Now, I'd been gone when God gave me the next instruction. Because he said, pick it back up again. Nope, no, nope, I'm gone. I've been cutting grass at the park on a riding lawnmower, and we have a big pile of brush that we've been gathering up, and it gets, it's getting bigger and bigger and bigger, and a little black snake, it was probably that big, um, just came slithering out of there. And, buddy, I was on a riding lawnmower and could have cut the thing in two, and I'm jumping up like a little girl scared to death on that riding lawnmower. I, I don't like Howard. I don't like Howard. I don't like snakes like Howard doesn't like snakes. And, uh, <laughs> huh? I, went, uh, I went the other direction. Somebody else can cut that, uh, that yard, that <laughs> part of the yard. <laughs> uh, these two were out in the lobby at church one Sunday morning. And a little garden snake, green snake was out there. It wasn't that big either. It's probably like a worm, <laughs> night crawler. I think it was a night crawler. It wasn't a snake. <laughs> Dad said, told Harry, he said, pick that thing up. He said, you're the man of faith and power. You pick that thing up. He went and got a tissue, <laughs> didn't you? He went and got a tissue and reached down there and picked that thing up. But he didn't kill it. Peter was happy. He didn't kill it. <laughs> uh, God appoints Aaron in chapter 4 to assist Moses, because Moses was concerned. Now, some scholars have said that Moses had a speech impediment or he stuttered. The Bible doesn't really point that out. Uh, <laughs> uh, he was perfect. In chapter 4, Moses departs from Jethro, his father-in-law. He heads down to Egypt. God's message to Pharaoh comes through Aaron and Moses. Um, in chapter 4 and chapter 5, Pharaoh um, gets upset with Moses and Aaron for their message. <laughs> yeah. So because of that, the children of Israel's tasks got harder. They started beating them harder. They started driving them more, one of them, to produce more bricks and mortar and get more built. Um, Moses checks on, on the children of Israel and their complaints. And they're crying out against Moses and Aaron because they said, you know, you said you're coming down here to deliver us and now we have to work harder. Uh, so what happens then is because the people are complaining to Moses and Moses is the mediator, Moses begins to complain to God for the people. Hmm. Yeah, sounds like a church service. Then chapter 6, God renewed his promise by his name Jehovah. Uh, Aaron and Moses uh, are again sent to Pharaoh. It, in chapter 6, there's the genealogy of Reuben and uh, Simeon and Levi. And it points that out because Moses comes out of that lineage. Uh, and Aaron does too. Aaron comes out of that lineage. What lineage of the tribes was Aaron from? Levi. He was a priest. And all the priests came from Levi. 
Chapter 7, Moses and Aaron are encouraged to go down to Pharaoh a third time. Uh, Aaron's rod begins, uh, turns into a serpent, and the sorcerers do the same, but their rods are swallowed up by Aaron's. And then for the first time we see in chapter 7, Pharaoh's heart is hardened. I say the first time because it happens again. Uh, and then God speaks through Moses and gives a message to Pharaoh. Then we see the first plague. Chapter 7, we see the first plague. Now we're still in chapter 12. Stay over there. I'm getting getting there. See, we see the first plague. It's blood. I'm not going to go through all these. The rivers turn to blood. Chapter 8, we see the frogs are sent. Um, chapter 8, we also see the dust is turned to lice, the plague of the flies. Pharaoh inclines to let the people go, but yet is hardened again. So he reneges on that and doesn't let them go. Uh, we have the murian of beast in chapter 9, the plague of the boils and the blains, the message of Moses about the hail, the plague of hail, and Pharaoh um, sues to Moses, but he, yet he's hardened again the third time. Chapter 10, God threatens to send locusts. Pharaoh moved by his servants and inclines to let the Israelites go. The plague of the locusts comes. Pharaoh entreats Moses. Then there's the plague of darkness. And Pharaoh again entreats Moses, but yet he's hardened again for the fifth time. God's message to the Israelites to borrow jewels from their neighbors. That's chapter 11. So <clears throat> I like what Dr. House says here. He says uh, they left Egypt with 400 years of back pay on their back. So God tells them to go and borrow jewels from all of their Egyptian neighbors. Moses threatens Pharaoh with the death of his firstborn in chapter 11. And then chapter 12 begins the, um, with the new covenant. Or, not the new covenant, it's the old covenant, but it's a, a new covenant that God is making. In chapter 12, verse 1, let's look at it. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, This month shall be to you the beginning of the months. So this, this, is, a new, this is a month in their calendar year that wasn't the first of the year. Let's say it's like it is here, it's June, and we know January is the first of the year, but God says now this is going to be the first month of the year. June now is going to be the first month of the year on your calendar. That's what God's saying. Tell all of the congregation of Israel on the tenth day of this month they shall take it. Okay, so now we've established that Israel will now have a new year calendar. The calendar starts now. This is the first of the year. And on that tenth day of that first month, this is what I want you to do. Tell all the congregation to do this. Every man, head of the house, take a lamb or a kid according to the size of the family of which he is the father. A lamb or a kid for each house. And if the household is too small to consume the lamb, let him and his next door neighbor take it according to the number of persons every man according to what each can eat shall make you your account for the lamb okay so now what he's saying is if mark's got a real big family it's probably going to take more than one lamb but one lamb for each family and if i'm not in a position where I have a lamb and marks my next door neighbor, I join in with him. Okay, each man helping his neighbor. Your lamb or kid, verse five, shall be without blemish. Okay, mark that down in your Bible. So underline that, circle that, make a note there. The lamb that they picked shouldn't have a blemish on it. That's important. It's a male. Lamb. So this is this is important. What's a male lamb called? A ram. Well, it got caught in the thicket. What did God say He would provide Himself? A ram. Now we we get we don't want to get caught up in ram or lamb, but I'll just tell you me personally. For years I was confused because I would get into the New Testament and God provided a lamb, not a ram. Because I wasn't smart enough to know that there were a male and a female. A new and a lamb, a ram, right? Okay. But it's to be a male and it's to be without blemish. And it was supposed to be of the first year. 
you shall take it from the sheep or from the goats. So if it was from the sheep, it would be what? A ram. If it was from the goats, it would be a... A billy. <laughs> billy goat. Is a kid a lamb? A billy. We just found out a billy. It's a billy goat. <laughs> Only in West Virginia. And you shall keep it until the 14th day of the same month. Okay. So on the 10th day, you pick the lamb out without blemish, a male one, or from the goats. You keep it until the 14th day of that same month, four days. And the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall each kill this lamb in the evening. So everybody's going to kill that lamb at the same time. It's going to be a specific time that that lamb is killed all at the same time, all of the children of Israel. It's important. Amen. It's important to know that. It's a buck. Or a billy. So he was right. Way to go, Duff. They shall take of the blood, verse 7. So they've killed it in the evening time. They shall take of the blood and put it on the two side posts and the lintel above the door space of their houses. Okay, so they've killed the lamb. They're going to take the blood and they're going to wipe the blood down each doorpost and across the lintel. Now, I'm stirred about this because I've never seen it. In the Hebrew alphabet, these two doorposts and across the lintel is very similar, if not almost exactly, the fifth letter of the Hebrew alphabet. Which is the number of grace. Look it up. Look up the Hebrew alphabet. Go to the fifth letter of the Hebrew alphabet. And you will see this drawing of this. It's two sticks with across the lintel. And it looks, that's, that's the number, or the Hebrew alphabet, grace. The fifth letter of the Hebrew alphabet. <laughs> okay, now they put the blood on the doorpost and the lintel above the door space of the houses in which they shall eat the Passover lamb. Go back. So, specifically, they have, we know pa the Passover lamb is put there, but in the original text, uh, go to the King James for me if you don't mind. So, in that which they shall eat. Okay. What are they going to eat? The lamb. Okay, they shall eat. Okay, next verse, 8. Thank you for doing that for me. I appreciate it. And they shall eat the flesh in that night. Now watch this. Roast with fire and unleavened bread and the bitter herbs. They shall eat it. Kathy did the Seder meal, Passover meal for us. That's what we ate. Okay. Shall roast it, verse 9. Eat now, eat not of it raw, nor sodden at all with water. In other words, don't boil it. Don't take the flesh and put it in water. Now, we're talking about the Passover lamb, and we said that in the Christology of Exodus, who's the Passover lamb? Jesus is the Passover lamb. What are they now? We get real stirred up, and we've heard a lot of preaching about taking the blood of that animal and applying it toward the doorpost and putting it on the lintel across the top. And we know from the story later on that the blood's going to cause the death angel to pass over, and when the blood's been applied to our hearts. But let me tell you something, folks. There's something that went on on the inside, on the other side of the blood. They were eating. Yes, sir. What were they eating? They were eating lamb. Yes, sir. Mutton. Nothing but mutton. Yeah. Huh? Yeah. Still a lamb. <laughs> Baby or... It's, it's lamb. And they're eating it. And if they're not boiling it in water. What does that mean? They're not watering it down. 
We've had a watered down lamb preach to us. Now watch this. With his head, with his legs, and with whatever that word is. So what's that mean? How much of it are they eating? How much of Jesus do you want? But see, we have some that will preach this part of Jesus, the head, and some will preach this part of Jesus, and some will take the legs, but they won't take the head. But then there will be a lot of people that will add water to it. They'll water it down. We don't preach a watered-down gospel. We don't preach a watered-down Jesus. And we preach it all. We want it all. Now, just let me play with words for just a second. Where, where were they when they were eating this lamb? Inside. And the lamb went inside their belly. And Jesus told his disciples, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no part of me. We've got to get Jesus on the inside. It's one thing to have the blood applied. Let's get Jesus on the inside. Eat more. We need a daily diet of the Lamb of God. Verse 10. And you shall let nothing of it remain until the morning. And so they had to pig out on it. <laughs> Eat it all. I wouldn't have a problem with that. I usually don't have leftovers. And that which, rema which remaineth of it until the morning you shall burn with fire. So if there was anything left, you didn't eat it, you burn it. Okay. And thus shall you eat it with your loins girded. In other words, you should have your pants on when you eat it. Your shoes on your feet. Your staff in your hand. And you shall eat it in haste. The first fast food meal. <laughs> said eat it with haste so there's your fast your first fast food meal is mentioned in Exodus the 12th chapter go back when I lost my place I'm sorry they got their shoes on they got their pants on or their robes probably and their staff in their hand so they're eating with this hand because they got their staff in their hand why because they're getting ready to go somewhere Next verse. It is the Lord's Passover. So all he just explained to you is the Passover. Not just the blood post on the doorpost and the lintel, but the eating of the lamb, all of it, not watered down, with the unleavened bread. I'm not a baker, but if you take the leaven out, doesn't it rise faster? Doesn't rise at all. That's why they could eat it faster. Didn't have to wait for it to no yeast, so it didn't rise. So it had they could eat it quick. Just boom, they made it. It was ready to go. Here's the here's the reason why he's calling it the Passover. For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night, and I will smite all of the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt. See how he put pluralized that? Why? Because they had over 400 gods they were trying to worship. I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. So he's going to judge Pharaoh and all the Egyptians. Who's he not going to judge? The ones that have accepted the blood, put it on the doorpost, and they've eaten the lamb. All of it. So who's going to be left behind? Those that have the blood applied and those that ate the lamb. Who's going to be taken? The firstborn in, in judgment. Verse 13, And the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. Now, it's, it's great that there's blood on the, the doorpost. And there's, it's great that they ate the lamb on the inside and that he says he's going to pass over. But he's not going to pass over because he saw the blood on the doorpost. That blood symbolizes something. It symbolizes that a death had occurred. 
the death of the Lamb had occurred for that house. There's one thing to say, you know, because even when people get into demonic stuff, they have, there's blood. They, they get into the blood stuff, okay? Somebody threatened that they were going to shed, the death angel would pass over. Verse 14, And this, this day, the fourteenth day of the first month, shall be unto you for a memorial. And you shall keep it at a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. You shall keep it as a feast by an ordinance forever. We're still keeping it. Now we don't do it on the first day of that month of the, Jew, of the Jewish calendar because we don't observe feasts and laws and rules and regulations. That's not how the kingdom comes. We do it in remembrance of Him. The memorial meal that we take is the communion, the Lord's Supper, when we partake of His body and His blood. Remembering what He did for us. Now let's look at that. What did these Jews do? God was going to deliver them, and all they were doing was obeying the instructions that He was going to do as He set the pattern out. They didn't work for their salvation. They just obeyed and applied the blood to the door. They, By faith, they believed that what if they would do what He said to do, that they would be saved. By faith. Because if they didn't believe it, they wouldn't have done it. And if they didn't do it, the death angel would have visited that home. And so to this day, the Jews still celebrate Passover. But in the New Testament, under the New Covenant, we're not celebrating it as a feast to observe. We're celebrating it in remembrance of what Christ, the pa our Passover lamb, did for us. Verse 15, seven days shall ye... Eat unleavened bread, even the first day you shall put away leaven out of your houses. For whosoever eateth leavened bread from the first day until the seventh day, that soul shall be cut off from Israel. Now, what we're doing is we're taking the yeast out. And there's several things in the New Testament that yeast is a, that we see as yeast is an example of, type and shadow of. And sometimes it represents sin. Uh, sometimes, not all the time. So he's trying to get that yeast out, okay? And in the first day there shall be an unholy convoca convocation, and in the seventh day there shall be an holy convocation to you. No manner of work shall be done in them, save that which every man must eat, that only may be done of you. Now what he's talking here is establishing the Sabbath. God rested on the seventh day. This is the seventh day of the rest. You do no work. And you shall observe the feast of the unleavened bread, for in this selfsame day have I brought your armies out of the land of Egypt. Therefore shall you observe this day and your generations by an ordinance forever. So now he's setting up feasts and ordinances. And we know, Romans 14th chapter, that the kingdom of God does not come by observation. So we don't observe these feasts and these covenants to do anything for us. That, that's a Jewish custom that, that happened in the Old Testament. Now, if you don't, if you want to keep those and think that that does something for you, then you're back up under an old covenant system, and you need to be killing a lamb and putting its blood on the doorpost, and then taking it inside and roasting it and eating it. Isn't that what he told them to do? And that's the feast that they observe. Now, when we do it, Kathy explained each element to us as we took the Seder meal. She was explaining what Christ did to us. She's explaining the type and shadow, the symbolism of every particular thing that we ate and why they ate it and the way that they did it and how it points to Christ. Because at Grace Life, we want to make sure everything takes us back to Jesus. Amen? And so this is another feast. You have the Passover and then they, after Passover, they observe the Feast of Unleavened Bread for seven days. Okay. And uh, so it's two different feasts going on here. What did Jesus celebrate with his disciples before he was crucified? They were celebrating the Passover. Where was he when he celebrated the Passover? He was in the upper room, but where's the upper room located? Jerusalem. So he had gone to the city where the temple was, to celebrate the Passover as the custom was for the Jews, but he had set his face like a flint days before. Why? Well, what did he know was there? The cross, which was God's will for his life. We don't have time tonight. We'll get, we'll get into it two weeks from tonight. 
We'll look at the specific time they killed that lamb. Why? Because it correlates with the specific time that Jesus was crucified. Because we know specific times that he was crucified. The Bible tells us plainly what those are. And so, if the Jews were keeping the Passover, because God had given it to them as an ordinance to keep to all, all generations, and Jesus went to Jerusalem, at the exact same time he was being nailed to the cross, the high priest in the temple was bringing the Passover lamb. Because they were still keeping the Passover feast. And they were going to kill the lamb. At the same exact time. Matter of fact, Jesus goes through a particular gate. It's called the sheep gate. That The lamb that was going to be taken to the temple would have came through the same exact gate to be sacrificed. That's right. The lamb selection. So we'll start looking at some of that uh, and this. And when we get done with that, we'll, we'll spend a week or two on the handing out of the law, the handing down of the law. Um, and then we'll spend a couple of weeks, maybe longer, and I'm probably going to ask Dad to talk a little bit about the tabernacle. He has a great teaching and studying on the, the tabernacle, and we'll look at the tent of God uh, in the Old Testament. And probably pull some slides out and show some some things because everything in the tabernacle is a type and shadow of Christ. Everything in it. And even the way the furniture was set up before they even knew anything about the cross, the furniture was set up in the shape of the cross. The tabernacle itself. We'll get into that. I don't want to spoil it for you. So, any questions? Comments? Hundreds of thousands of lambs that were killed that night, they're always referred to as a singular lamb. Yep. Share that. All every home of the Jews, and most scholars will tell you six million Jews left Egypt. So can you think of the hundreds of thousands of lambs that were slain that night? But yet in the text it's only referred to as a singular lamb. Pointing to Jesus, the Lamb of God. Yes. Herod. Mm -hmm. Yep. <laughs> yeah, that sounds yeah sounds accurate to, for the Romans uh, at that. Uh, again, you know, a lot of times uh, we, as ministers, just get up and share things, and we um, assume that people know what you're talking about. They, we assume that everybody's had a Greek class, and we assume that everybody's studied their Bible and those things that they should know. But we don't, and, and that doesn't mean that we're not that, that we're ignorant. That just means that we haven't been taught. We've been preached at a lot, but we've not been taught a lot. Uh, I'm thankful for my heritage and the teaching that we received Wednesday nights. Growing up was teaching night for years and years and years, and we saw I saw a lot of great uh, teaching and these types and shadows that I learned before I ever went to Bible college. Uh, that uh, really, literally, sitting under Dad on Wednesday nights at Maranatha for years was Bible college. And uh, it was a, a great, great uh, foundation to take. So now that when you get fresh revelation, you're not sifting because you don't have a firm foundation. We have a firm foundation of Jesus. Uh, and that's been very, very helpful uh, down through life. So we sure love you guys. Thankful that you keep coming out and learning. Uh, we trust that some of the things that we teach and share are helping you to grow and to mature uh, in your walk with Christ because mature believers have right thinking and right believing and that leads to right living.
uh, if we can have that. So let's get rid of our stinking thinking and uh, move on to right belief.